All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Perkins, and I'm a current second year neurotology fellow at Vanderbilt and incoming faculty member. And today I'm excited to speak to you about a topic that is uh, near and dear to my heart, and that's the expanding indications in pediatric cochlear implantation. Uh, but the real goal of this talk is to provide you with up-to-date knowledge of the literature and really to provide a better understanding of what we know and kind of what we don't know. Uh, so I hope you enjoy. I personally do not have any disclosures. So in 1987, the first multi-channel cochlear implant was approved by the FDA in adults. And it wasn't until the 1900s that the FDA approved cochlear implantation in children less than 24 months of age. So here's an abbreviated timeline, but you can see the progression and evolution of our implant criteria. In 2000, the age limit was reduced to 12 months, followed by nine months in 2020. And in 2014, EAS is approved in adults. And in 2019, single-sided deafness is approved for any patient greater than five years of age. Despite our technological advances, we're still lagging in our pediatric implant criteria. So counterintuitively, the indications for implantation for children who need, who need hearing for speech and language development are stricter than adults. And so this is a chart that I have listed here. It compares the difference between the evolving criteria in adults versus children. And currently the pediatric criteria are expanding to include the younger age of implantation, residual hearing, single-sided deafness, and cochlear anomalies. And so this evolving criteria is what really drove the outline for my talk today. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about everything from hearing preservation, the benefits of combined electric and acoustic simulation in children, age of implantation and single-sided deafness. So first, beginning with hearing preservation. So over the last decade or so, the implantation for adults has expanded to include those with preserved low frequency hearing. And we know the benefits of hearing preservation in the setting of cochlear implantation. And that is improved speech perception and noise, music appreciation, per pitch perception, and sound localization. And we believe that due to the access of the acoustic cues provided by the low frequency hearing. So this includes hearing at the fundamental frequency and interval timing difference. Uh, but the question is, is, how do children really differ from adults? Um, and that is, you know, children can have progressive hearing loss. And yeah, can we preserve hearing and implant them with a conventional length electrode in the setting of that progressive loss, really thinking about cochlear coverage. And there has been a substantial evidence for hearing preservation in children. Uh, so there's a multitude of studies that I listed here that have shown that, okay, we can preserve hearing in children. Uh, we can do this with various, various length electrodes and array types, uh, but does this rate different than adults? Is there anything different that we need to be thinking about? Um, but so there's two large studies these are the two largest studies that have demonstrated hearing preservation in children. Uh, so this first study, that I've listed here more, most recently is from Selk et al. from UNC. They implant 105 children. They defined hearing preservation of LFPTA less than 90, uh, and they reported an 82% hearing preservation rate, which is excellent. Um, and 100% hearing preservation rate uh, of the kids that were implanted with the Metal Flex 24 by a single surgeon. Um, but if you look at, if you, if you make their hearing preservation criteria more strict, so less than 80 decibels at 250 hertz, which is closer uh, to some of the other studies, the hearing preservation rate is about 68%. Um, they did a multiple logistics regression analysis, which showed that a shorter lateral wall electrode or preoperative LFPTA and round window insertion were all associated with uh, improved improved hearing preservation post-operatively. The next study is from Carlson et al. Uh, 2017. So they had 43 kids. Interestingly, they implanted these children with conventional length electrodes. That's a big difference between their two studies. Uh, and they defined post-operative hearing preservation as an LFPTA less than 85. And they report a 65% hearing preservation rate with a mean shift of 25.2. But interestingly that they Notice no association between LPDA shift and electrode type. So now knowing that we can preserve hearing in children with conventional like electrodes, uh, you really need to be thinking of, you know, does, do children benefit from access to uh, the low frequency cues in both bilaterally? Uh, and so we know in adults that a cochlear implant and a hearing aid, which is EAS, 
and then when they're fit with that in one ear and a, and a hearing aid in the other ear is better than a cochlear implant and a hearing aid for speech recognition and noise and spatial hearing tasks. And that translates to two to five decibel improvement in your SRT, a 13 percentage point in uh, speech and noise and a 20, 20 degree benefit for spatial hearing tasks. And there have been a handful of studies that have reported combined electric and acoustic simulation in children, but not a ton. But the question we really need to ask is, is do children benefit from EAS compared to a full electrode map? Do they benefit with EAS better than their preoperative hearing aid condition? And this is essential because when you're thinking about when is the best time to implant children who have low frequency hearing that we wanna make sure we preserve and, and deciding on that time can be particularly challenging for the audiologist and the surgeon. And can children be fit with EAS after wearing a full electro mat for a length of time? And so this is a study from UNC where they looked at um, 20 children who were either implanted or had been implanted for a year who were fit with EAS. So they took 16 kids between four and 16 years of age, arm one, so these are patients that were newly implanted with a conventional length electrode and were immediately fit with EAS. And arm two were children that had been wearing a cochlear implant for a year and then were fit with EAS and retested in CNC baby bio scores one to three months after being fit with EAS. And what they found is first is that scores in the EAS condition were significantly higher than a full electrode map condition for CNC words and baby bio noise. And then secondarily, CNC words increased significantly from their preoperative hearing aid condition with EAS, not the full electrode map, and the AZ bio sentences increased significantly from the hearing aid condition and not the full electrode condition, which is surprising. Although there was a trend towards improved performance when listening to noise, and prior research does show that post legally deafened children and adults do well with conventional cochlear implant programming, even with significant residual hearing. And you know, their authors thought that maybe this difference may be potentiated by the fact that the children wearing the EAS were tested acutely in the full electro map, so they weren't used to those settings. And lastly, the scores in the EAS condition were significantly higher than the full electro condition for CNC words, and, but not baby bio for the the children that were, had been implanted for a year and then tried EAS for one to three months. So, you know, thinking about this, or like, what are the real challenges of combined electric and acoustic stimulation in kids? And the first is, it's same with adults. They don't like wearing the acoustic component. I think a lot of people see it as, if, well, I got the implant, and why would I also have to wear something that goes in my ear like a hearing aid? Um, and then, you know, for, you know, the surgeons and audiologists, it's the timing of implantation in children who have residual hearing because there are such benefits to preserving that low frequency hearing. Um, and then, you know, we don't know how EAS impacts the developing renal hearing system. And there's been a lot of research showing that, that this system may not develop until adolescence, even in normal hearing children. And it's fascinating, but there is no relationship between residual hearing and speech performance. Um, and overall, what I'll leave you with is that there's no published study yet, and that's what Dr. Renee Gifford's lab is working on that has determined the EAS benefit in children beyond that from bimodal hearing for binaural listening tasks. So next, moving on to age of implantation. Um, in 2000, cochlear implantation children was approved for kids less than 12 months and in 2020, less than nine months. Uh, and we know that overall earlier is better. And that is because the goal really is optimization of listening and spoken language. And ideally, we always want to implant someone before three years of age if we can. And this is due to the fact that neuroplasticity it is at its um, height when the, when the child is less than three years of age. Um, and there's been recent studies in animal models of deafness and in children that consistently show evidence of what's called oral preference syndrome in which single-sided deafness in early childhood reorganizes the developing auditory pathway toward the hearing ear with weaker central re representation of the deaf ear. But studies have also shown is that 
this oral preference system can be reversible if the kid is implanted less than three years. Uh, we know that implanting earlier improves vocabulary outcomes, speech production and auditory performance and receptive language scores. So there's been robust evidence for cochlear implantation in less than 12 months, and there's even more progressive evidence for less than nine months. And before 12 months, we know that the kids that are implanted before 12 months have better receptive and expressive language skills, improve vocabulary, and they acquire these skills at a faster rate compared to those who are implanted greater than 12 months. But one study has shown there's been no difference in the word recognition scores or speech performance between those who are implanted before or after 12 months. I think the main thing that we need to be asking ourselves is, are we being safe? And we wanna think about the risks of the intraoperative anesthetic events that raises the concern for implanting kids at a younger age. So there's been two studies that have used the National Security Quality Improvement uh, Pediatric Database, where they evaluated uh, pediatric cochlear implant recipients that were less than 12 months of age, greater than 12 months over a three year time period, they didn't see any significant difference in complication rates, post operative length of stay, and reoperation rates, but operation times and readmission rates were higher in a younger cohort. There's another study by Holman et al. in 2013 that showed similar results that so there was no, no large difference between the two ages. But what about less than nine months? Because right now, like a lot of neurotologists advocate for implanting children at six months of age, up to six, as young as six months of age, especially if they have something as solidifying as like connexin 26 mutation. So this is a recent study from Mayo where they looked at the surgical factors and the complication rates of various age groups. So this includes before nine months, between nine and 11 months, and then they also separated it between 12, less than 12 months, 12 to 24, and then 12 to 23, and then over 24. Um, what they found is, is that the younger cohorts spend a little bit more time in PACU, they're more likely to be implanted bilaterally, more likely to undergo a round window approach, and more likely to be admitted or stay overnight. And um, when looking at complication rates, the overall complication rate between the groups were very similar and there's no significant difference. The only difference they noticed that is that the younger age group were more likely to have a superficial surgical site infection, such as a stitch abscess. And then once again, by separating the cohorts between less than nine months, which is you know, the question we wanna focus on now in between nine and 11 months, is that again, they're more likely to be bilaterally implanted and undergo a round window approach. And in terms of complication rate, Overall, they reported that 14% of our patients had a complication. There is no significantly higher rates of surgical, anesthetic, or device-related complications in those less than 12 months. And then same for those who were less than nine months compared to 9-11 months, but they did note that, that higher rate of that superficial surgical site infection. And the kids less than 12 months were more likely to be readmitted and have overnight observation, which they really contributed to being an institutional preference. So overall, when thinking of age of implantation, your goal really is to make sound decision making and mitigate risk. And you do this through, you know, thorough preoperative evaluation, uh, working with a team, a, a pediatric anesthesia team, uh, because the current FDA recommends that general anesthetic be limited to three hours for those children that are less than three years of age for an elective procedure. And of course, when you think about age of implantation, you want to think about their global development, their comorbidities and family support, and of course, anatomy. So we know that the mastoid is a little slightly underdeveloped before 12 months, but the facial recess develops at, is nearly developed at six to eight months of age. So lastly, moving on to single-sided deafness. So here, throughout this talk, I'm going to find single-sided deafness as unilateral hearing loss. So normal hearing in the contralateral ear. And we know that Hearing in both ears is great for sound localization, speech recognition, noise, and listening in complex environments. And this is due to the benefits of the head shadow effect, binaural squelch, and summation. And children with single-sided deafness are not small adults. And children with single-sided deafness, just like adults though, do have impaired listening and voice, but they require additional learning support 
that require a higher signal to noise ratio than adults for speech recognition. Up to a third of children with single-sided deafness or PETA grade have behavioral concerns in addition to communication difficulties. And you know, the trouble is, is that children are trying to learn in a noisy environment. Um, and this is what can contribute to something called auditory fatigue, meaning that you know the, the fatigue the child can experience extreme fatigue at the end of the day, especially after straining all day listening with one ear. And right now, cochlear implant is the only hearing re rehabilitation option that restores binaural hearing. And we know that the benefit that cochlear implantation, single-sided deafness has its benefits. And like I said before, it's improved speech and noise, sound localization, tinnitus suppression, and reduced signal to noise ratio. And there's been multiple studies that have demonstrated this. And what the problem is, is that they're limited because they're heterogeneous. They have various duration of deafness in their population, patient age, compliance to the device, and various testing conditions, which I think is very important in single-sided deafness. And to truly determine the benefit, it's best to test any patient in spatially separated speech and noise. Um, and what I mean by that is masked speech recognition is typically better when the target and masker are spatially separated on the horizontal plane compared to when they're co-located, like shown in my picture here. And this benefit is described as spatial release from masking or SRM. So this is a recent study kind of hot off the press um, from the University of North, North Carolina where they tested 20 children and spatial release from masking. And you know, this is the first prospective study of SRM in children with single-sided deafness. And children in single-sided deafness, what they noticed is they improved in their SRM when the signal was in front, the noise was in front, and when the masker was moved to either side. And what this tells us is that, you know, not only do they benefit with speech recognition and noise uh, with the cochlear implant, but that the cochlear implant has no detrimental impact on the contralateral performance, which is key. So overall, I'm gonna leave you with thinking and you know, overall conclude that pediatric cochlear implant criteria is evolving to include patients with low frequency hearing and single-sided deafness, but there is much to be learned regarding the benefits of fitting children with EAS. And implanting children less than 12 months and even less than nine months of age is safe with the appropriate team. And cochlear implantation and single side deafness can be beneficial for improved listening in mineral tasks. So I just want to thank everyone for your attention. Uh, and thank you for attending our course. We're happy to have you. And if anyone has any questions about my talk, feel free to email me as it's listed here. Enjoy the rest of the day.